I'm, uh, I'm a little familiar with Zachary Richard's work and uh, know him uh, as a musician. Uh, he takes Cajun influence, he takes Zydeco, he takes New Orleans, he adds a touch of Acadian, a little of Quebec, and uh, out comes this wonderful musical gumbo. Uh, but it turns out he doesn't want to play for you today. He wants to talk, so that's what we'll do. Zachary will talk, but first I thought you should hear a little of his music just to get a flavor of the man. Ladies and gentlemen, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. When, when I received the invitation from Moses, I have to admit I was a little surprised. Um, looking at the roster of the, of the presenters uh, at this conference, one of the things that struck me was the, um, the absence of, of a lot of francophone uh, participants. And what perplexed me the most is I was at a loss to imagine what I was going to talk to you about, and I was afraid that maybe um, one of my friends in Montreal said, don't go to Toronto, they will hit you. <laughs> so I, I had to check the menu, make sure that there was no blackened Cajun turkey on the menu tonight before I, before I accepted to come, but uh, I'm glad to be here. And I would like to talk, what I would like to talk to you about is something that I feel very passionate about, and it's the history of, of my community in South Louisiana, but I would hopefully like to provoke a larger reflection on the maintenance of minority identity in this era of globalization. Globalization can mean a lot of things. To me, it means either one of two things. It means the ability of multinational corporations to move jobs to places where they don't have to worry about the quality of the workers' lives or the quality of the environment. But there's another much more interesting aspect of globalization to me, and that is the ability of heretofore isolated groups of citizens, of concerned people who are able to associate themselves across international boundaries in order to struggle for the benefit of either mankind or the environment or whatever causes or, excuse me, uh, particularly of concern to that community. And that's an interesting aspect of the survival of the French language and the Cajun community in southwest Louisiana at this time. Um, but before I get to the contemporary story, I'd like to sort of go back in time just a little bit because I think something that you might be interested in and, and that you might not know a lot about is the history of the Cajun community. In Louisiana, uh, everybody knows that we eat spicy food and we dance real good and we talk kind of funny. But other than that, even people inside of Louisiana know very little about the history. Um, my ancestors, people think that the Acadians were deported uh, from what's today Nova Scotia directly to Louisiana, and in fact it took at least 10, and in, in one case uh, for the last wave of migration, as many as 30 years for the, Acadia, uh, the Acadian excuse me, exiles to arrive in Louisiana. And what's interesting about it, and, and the most interesting aspect, talking about global communication, is that the people that arrived in Louisiana, the, the Acadians as as you probably know, were deported in 1755 in what could probably be best characterized as, as a, an ethnic cleansing in terms of today's parlance. The people were sent into exile. There was a very small armed resistance, which was led by a man named Beausoleil Broussard. But after the fall of Quebec, he was no longer able to provide for his family and his troops, his, his first cousins, in effect, and he surrendered. 
and he spent three years uh, in detention, which allowed him as a prisoner of war under the terms of the Treaty of Paris to be uh, transported to French territory, which at that time no longer meant Quebec, meant the closest place being Haiti. And so in February of 1765, uh, 10 years after the deportation, 200 and, excuse me, 321 people left uh, Halifax headed for uh, Saint-Domingue, Haiti. And the legend has that they stayed there just long enough to have a dance and get some fresh water because what they really wanted to do was to go up the Mississippi River and return to Quebec and come in through the back door and return to Acadie. But when they got to Louisiana, they said, Kyo, we like it here, we think we're gonna stay. <laughs> in that company of Beausoleil Broussard was his first cousin who was my direct ancestor, Pierre Richard. They were all first cousins. Acadie was just one big clan, in fact. And that was the reason uh, that they, the Acadians were under the illusion they could negotiate their neutrality with the British because for over 100 years they had developed a society which depended exclusively on the clan network. Uh, they were isolated significantly enough, both politically and geographically, to allow this illusion to exist. Anyway, when they got to Louisiana, they said, Kyo, we like it here, y'all come. And the most absolutely fascinating part of the whole story was there were Acadians in the Falkland Islands, in, in uh, Guinea, in the, uh, South America, IET, and all of the 13 British uh, North American colonies to which they had been originally exiled. They were Acadians in detention in England and all of the port cities of Western France. And within six months, the entire pan-Acadian community, which was scattered all around the Atlantic Basin, knew that there were Acadians in Louisiana. How did they know there was no postal service? Obviously, what happened was they would write or have written letters which they would give to a traveler because very, very shortly after the Acadians arrived in, in Louisiana, they began cattle farming. And there were constant cattle drives to the city of New Orleans. Travelers would go to New Orleans with a letter, give it to an Acadian sailor who would sail to Baltimore or Philadelphia or some other place. And next thing you know, everybody knew what was going on. And in about tens at a time, families that after the Treaty of Paris particularly from the colonies of Maryland and Pennsylvania, began to arrive in Louisiana. And the other thing that's, I think it's important to understand is that this really forged a, a common identity because no matter where the Acadians were, both before the, the, the exile and during the exile, they were considered to be a people apart. Whether they were in France or in the British North American colonies, wherever they were, they were apart. They stayed together, which reinforced their idea, that their, their identity as a separate people. When they got to Louisiana, however, within a very, very short time, that identity was challenged by uh, capitalism. In fact, it was the acquisition of slaves. There was a small part of the Acadian community which, which was able to integrate itself into the Anglo-American and Creole aristocracy through the acquisition of slaves. And those people who were the natural leaders of the community became, in fact, separated for the, from the community because they integrated into either the Creole or the Anglo-American aristocracy and began to send their children off to school, not as the Creoles did to Paris, but to the uh, universities of the East United States. The greatest example of this is Alexandre Mouton, who was a senator, Jacksonian a Democrat, elected senator at the United States uh, Senate. He, was, he became subsequently um, governor of the state of Louisiana and president of the Secession Convention of 1860. He was a fire eater. He was the one that led the Southern delegation out of the Democratic Convention in Charleston in 1860 and ba basically broke the back of Stephen Douglas. And uh, uh, we all know the result of that. Uh, just a little uh, parenthesis. Uh, you probably don't know this. It was a surprise to me. Alex, um, Abraham Lincoln was not on the ballot in 1860 in, in the state of Louisiana. You couldn't vote for uh, Abraham Lincoln. But anyway, you, you could have voted for Alexandre Mouton as governor. Alexandre Mouton's grandfather was an exile from Grand Pré. Uh, his father, Jean, had been born in Nova Scotia uh, the year of the exile, first generation. But Alexandre Mouton considered himself to be a Creole. He considered himself to be a Creole and not 
an Akkadian. There was already within the community um, a sort of negation of the Akkadian aspects of the heritage, which was reinforced more and more. The Civil War was a terrible time for Louisiana. Um, the roads, what little roads there were, were all destroyed by the invading federal armies. Uh, the, the waterways, which had been the highways of communication, were all blocked with all of these wrecks, all of these uh, um, ships during the war that had been sank. Uh, the, the fields had lain fallow for one or two or three years, which means that they were completely invaded by les arbalapul, the Cherokee trees and things that uh, people had spent lifetimes to, to, uh, to clean the fields. And basically the Cajun community spent uh, from 1860 to 1940 mired in a, in a very chronic uh, situation of poverty. I say, I say the Acadian community of Louisiana because n the great majority of the people, over 97% of the people, were, were all small subsist subsistence farmers. And it was in this community that the culture was able to maintain itself. The language was developed uh, the music that we know, that came to be known as Cajun music was developed. I should also point out though the, that there was a lot of assimilation that was going on at this time. It was um, Englishmen, Irishmen, Spaniards, Germans, people of other ethnic groups who were downwardly mobile, who married Acadian women and became part of the Cajun community, their children becoming Cajuns. Um, the upwardly mobile Cajuns became other than or divorced themselves from the community and began to speak English and to communicate with the larger Anglo-American community of Louisiana, whereas the Cajun people, the French-speaking Cajun people, were still geographically and socially isolated, which was what allowed, in fact, the culture and uh, the language to exist as long as it has in Louisiana. During the 20th century, there was a few significant events, one of which was the public uh, education law of 1916, which obliged all the children in Louisiana to go to school, which meant that my father, when he went to school the first day, um, he had never heard the English language. He was, he was forbidden to speak French on the school grounds. Children were, uh, it, it was, there was no official policy. There was no memo written by the Department of Education of the state of Louisiana saying, you must do this. But it was obvious that there was a, a significant amount of, of oppression vis-a-vis uh, -vis the French language. Children were humiliated, beaten. And it's a story that's been told uh, many other times around the world. It's something that touches me particularly um, because it created in the Cajun community a great sense of ambivalence vis-a-vis -vis their own culture. Uh, children were brought up at six and seven years old. Uh, they were introduced to the English language culture in a way which which created a certain amount of shame in the Cajun community, which has been our greatest handicap as a community to overcome in the preservation of our heritage. The other significant event of the, of the early 20th century was the flood of 1927, uh, which was, as you know, the greatest natural disaster in the history of the United States. There were over three million people who were refugees. Amongst them were about 50,000 Cajun people who left the backwater swamps to enter into the refugee camps out on the prairie and for the first time, excuse me, encountered electricity, uh, indoor plumbing. Uh, my mother was six years old at the time and she remembers, she says, uh, the people at, at my grandfather's house were corded like firewood uh, they, because it was open house. Anybody that would show up was allowed to, uh, to stay in the house. And my grandmother would tell a story. Um, they had electricity. We had electricity. Uh, we were way out the, on, the, on the cusp of civilization. And there was a, an, a refugee family that was staying with my grandparents. And my grandmother said, please, when you go to bed, turn out the light. So my grandmother gets up and she was a, she was a, we were, the family was poor. So uh, she was worried about the electricity bill. So she noticed that the electric light was still on. So she said to the lady, I thought I told you to turn out the light. The lady said, well, I blew and I blew and I blew, but it didn't go out. <laughs> this was the first time that a lot of Cajun people were dragged into the 20th century. But the most significant event was the Second World War, when for the first time, young Cajun men were taken out. Most of them uh, spoke only French, were drafted into the United States Army, and encountered this entire uh, 
uh, civilization of which they had only been vaguely familiar at that time. And this is an important point because this is, has got to do with the identity of the people. And in the preservation of uh, a, an ethnic culture, an ethnic minority culture, the most important thing is that one identifies with that culture. And there was a, a very significant shift between my grandfather and my father. My, my grandfather, when he talked about les Américains, my grandfather did not speak English. When he talked about les Américains, it was always a pejorative term. The Americans, les Américains, for my grandfather, was somebody that was outside of the community and was a little bit sneaky. Whereas for my father, an American, he was an American. He had gone off to save democracy for the world. He was very proud and is very proud of being an American. There was a, that significant shift. And so I was brought up. Now, I was born in 1950 when demographically 50% of the uh, population of Southwest Louisiana was still monolingual Francophone. My grandfather, at the beginning of the 20th century, 85% of the people of Southwest Louisiana, and we know this because of the American census reports, 85% of the people of Southwest Louisiana were monolingual Francophone. 1950, it was 50-50, and that's when the slide started. Today, approximately, there are approximately 250,000 Francophones in Louisiana, of whom the great majority are over uh, 60, 70, 80 years old. What happened was when my father returned from the war, his generation, with this new American identity and the association of shame that was attached to the French language and the Cajun culture, began to speak to my generation, their children, in English. And that was effectively the most difficult thing in the preservation of, of, of an, that there's a few things that you need to have if you're gonna preserve a, a minority ethnic culture. It helps to have a territory, obviously. And it is essential to continue the maternal language. When the language is spoken at the home, when it's, when it's no longer spoken at the home, then you have, <clears throat> excuse me, as we have in Louisiana, a problem. Um, the news, the good news is that with the development of a global network of francophonie, uh, finally in Louisiana, we're beginning to develop an identity which will hopefully allow us to preserve uh, the culture and the language. The, the conclusion that I would offer you is that in, in Louisiana, anyway, from the inside, uh, the inside story of the, of the Cajun community, there's one of two things that could happen, and I think what really is going to happen, either the French language and the culture will, will disappear, or what I really do believe will happen, uh, for a lot of reasons, is that we will become, in many ways, as the Irish. Uh, the English language will dominate, will be the language of everyday life and the economy, etc. But there will be places where as in Ireland, <coughs> excuse me, Gaelic is spoken. In Louisiana, French will be spoken. And it's got to do with the development of a new identity in which a new generation will take pride in their heritage. And this is due, in, in, to a large extent, to this global phenomenon uh, when we have become aware in Louisiana that we are part of a, of a larger community which includes les Québécois, les Français, and all of the French-speaking peoples around the world who, in fact, have devoted a lot of resources to developing French immersion in Louisiana, which is um, a, a program which has been extremely effective, very fragile because of the political situation has to be, um, has to be uh, uh, subventionné, has to be paid for by the school boards, and, and the school boards are very conservative and very reluctant since most of them are older Cajun people. They're all Cajuns, but most of them are older Cajun people and still have a sense of inferiority uh, when they are confronted with uh, the Anglo-American culture vis-a-vis -vis their own Cajun culture. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. Maybe uh, I think, uh, oh, here comes Moses, so maybe he changed his mind about this black and Cajun thing. So I'm going to, um, I thank you for your attention, and, and I wish you a good day. Thank you.